home. Soon we had left the village behind us and were in open country. There was no one else in sight, just the two of us, my father and I, tired but happy, striding out along the curvy country road in the light of the moon. I can't believe it, my father kept saying. I simply cannot believe we pulled it off. My heart is still thumping, I said. So is mine. So is mine. But oh, Danny, he cried, laying a hand on my shoulder. Didn't we have a glorious time? We were walking right in the middle of the road as though it were a private driveway running through our country estate and we were the lords of all we surveyed. Do you realize, Danny, my father said, that on this very night, on this Friday the 30th of September, you and I have actually bagged 120 prime pheasants from Mr. Victor Hazel's wood? I looked at my father. His face was alight with happiness and his arms were waving all over the place as he went prancing along the middle of the road with his funny iron foot going clink, clink, clink. Roasted pheasant, he cried out, addressing the moon and the entire countryside. The finest and most succulent dish on earth. I don't suppose you've ever eaten roasted pheasant, have you, Danny? Never, I said. You wait, he cried. You just wait till you taste it. It has an unbelievable flavor. It's sheer magic. Does it have to be roasted, Dad? Of course, it has to be roasted. You don't ever boil a young bird. Why do you ask that? I was wondering how we would do the roasting, I said. Don't you have to have an oven or something? Of course, he said. But we don't have an oven, Dad. All we've got is a paraffin burner. I know, he said. And that is why I have decided to buy an oven. By one. I cried. Yes, Danny, he said. With such a great and glorious stock of pheasants on our hands, it is important that we have the proper equipment. Therefore we shall go back into the village tomorrow morning and we shall buy an electric oven. We can get one at Wheeler's. And we'll put it in the workshop. We've got plenty of electric plugs in the workshop. Won't it be very expensive? No expense is too great for roasted pheasant, my father announced superbly. And don't forget, Danny, before we put the bird in the oven, we have to lay strips of fat bacon across the breast to keep it nice and juicy. And bread sauce, too. We shall have to make bread sauce. You must never have roasted pheasant without lashings of bread sauce. There are three things you must always have with roasted pheasant, bread sauce, chipped potatoes, and boiled parsnips. There was half a minute's silence as we both allowed ourselves the pleasure of dreaming about these beautiful foods. And I'll tell you what else we've got to get, my father said. We've got to get one of those deep freezers where you can store things for months and months and they never go rotten. Dad. I said. No. But don't you realize, Danny, that even after we've given birds away to all our friends, to Charlie Kinch and the Reverend Clipstone and Doc Spencer and Enoch Samways and all the rest of them, there'll still be about fifty left for us. That is why we are going to need a deep freezer. But it'll cost the earth. And worth every penny of it, he cried. Just imagine, Danny, my boy, any time we fancy a nice roasted pheasant for our supper, all we've got to do is open up the lid of the freezer and help ourselves. Kings and queens don't live any better than that. A barn owl flew across the road in front of us, its great white wings waving slowly in the moonlight. Did your mom have an oven in the kitchen, 
Dad, I asked, when you were a boy. She had something better than an oven, he said. It was called a cooker. It was a great big long black thing and we used to stoke it up with coal and keep it going for 24 hours a day. It never went out. And if we didn't have any coal, we used bits of wood. Could you roast pheasants in it? You could roast anything in it, Danny. It was a lovely thing, that old cooker. It used to keep the whole house warm in the winter. But you never had a cooker of your own, did you, Dad, you and Mum, when you got married? Or an oven? No, he said. We couldn't afford things like that. Then how did you roast your pheasants? Ah, he said. That was quite a trick. We used to build a fire outside the caravan and roast them on a spit, the way the gypsies do. What's a spit? I asked. It's just a long metal spike and you stick it through the pheasant and put it over the fire and keep turning it round. What you do is you push two forked sticks into the ground, one on each side of the fire, and you rest the spit on the forks. Did it roast them well? Fairly well, he said. But an oven would do it better. Listen Danny, Mr. Wheeler has all sorts of marvelous ovens in his shop now. He's got one in there with so many dials and knobs on it, it looks like the cockpit of an airplane. Is that the one you want to buy, Dad? I don't know, he said. We'll decide tomorrow. We kept walking and soon we saw the filling station glimmering in the moonlight ahead of us. Will Mr. Rabbits be waiting for us, do you think, Dad? I asked. If he is, you won't see him, Danny. They always hide and watch you from behind a hedge or a tree, and they only come out if you are carrying a sack over your shoulder or if your pocket is bulging with something suspicious. We are carrying nothing at all. So don't worry about it. Whether or not Mr. Rabbits was watching us as we entered the filling station and headed for the caravan, I don't know. We saw no sign of him. Inside the caravan, my father lit the paraffin lamp, and I lit the burner and put the kettle on to make us a cup of cocoa each. That, my father said as we sat sipping our hot cocoa a few minutes later, was the greatest time I've ever had in my whole life.